welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we are going to be talking about the story of Muriel McKay and her disappearance in 1969. This would prove to be something much more sinister. This case is one that I did not know much about before researching it, but after reading about the facts it's definitely not a story that should be forgotten. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners might find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. On the 29th of December 1969, Alec Mackay returned to his home at 20 Arthur Street in Wimbledon, London, close to the famous tennis courts and park. It was around 8pm that evening, and Alec entered the home that he shared with his wife Muriel. After entering the house, Alec was quick to notice that the front door was open and the lights were on, but Muriel was not in, which was unexpected. He also noticed a number of other things that were unusual. One of the things that Alec Mackay discussed in a later interview is that he noticed immediately that the fire was on, without the fire guard around it. He knew that was odd, as his wife reportedly was always so careful about putting the fire guard around the fire, as she was worried about an accident happening, particularly as they had a dog. Another thing that was noticed was that the phone had been pulled out of the wall, and his wife's handbag had been opened, and the contents were all over the stairs. The scene was strange, and Alec had the immediate feeling that something was wrong. His wife was meant to be at home and the fact that she had left such a strange scene behind her was very unlike what she'd normally do. Alec quickly rang police and explained what had happened. While the police agreed that it was an unusual situation and that it did seem odd, they could not definitively say that she had come to any harm. They initially could not tell if something more sinister had happened or if this was just a case of a wife leaving a husband. Without investigating further into these details, police weren't able to make this judgement. Alec at this point was beside himself and decided to try anything to get the information out there that his wife was missing. He contacted the tabloid newspaper The Sun and asked them if they would run a story about Muriel being missing. This wasn't a completely random action by Alec as he worked as an executive and deputy to media tycoon Rupert Murdoch. In 1969, Murdoch now owned the News of the World newspaper and had not long since acquired the Sun newspaper from the International Publishing Corporation. He had recently begun printing it as a tabloid newspaper in November that year. Due to his close connections to both Murdoch and the paper, they quickly agreed to run the story about Muriel's disappearance. Alec and his wife Muriel were very close to Murdoch, and like him, they were Australian. They were so close, in fact, that at the time of Muriel's disappearance, Alec was borrowing Rupert's Rolls Royce to get around, and that was how Alec had arrived back home on the 29th of December, while Rupert and his wife Anna were on holiday in Australia. The story ran on the front page of The Sun the next day, with the headline, Mystery of Press Chief's Vanished Wife. This gained national coverage for Muriel's disappearance and ensured that everyone knew what could possibly have happened to her. It is often reported that the police weren't happy that the case had been so publicly reported, as it perhaps had not given them the chance to do any investigation into the disappearance. Muriel's story was quickly disseminated across the country, and it was clear as she had not returned the next day that some harm could possibly have come to her. The family waited to see if Muriel returned, or any other news came in about where she might be. Regardless of whether it was a good idea to publish details of the disappearance so early, at midnight on the 30th of December, the Mackay house got a phone call. The call was eventually traced to a phone box at Bellcommon, Epping, which was around 30 miles or an hour and 18 minute car journey away from Wimbledon, where the Mackays lived. The phone call would prove to be extremely chilling. The voice on the other end of the line told Alec Mackay, We are Mafia M3. We are from America. We tried to get Rupert Murdoch's wife. We couldn't get her, so we took yours instead. 
You have a million by Wednesday night, or we will kill her. The phone call ended there. Alec was horrified by what he had heard. The fact that someone had kidnapped Muriel was shocking. And the thing that also struck him was that they had not intentionally intended on kidnapping his wife, but that of his boss, Rupert Murdoch. The concept of abducting famous people or wealthy individuals was not unheard of. However, in the UK, these sorts of incidents had not often happened. The phone call made clear that despite knowing that Muriel was not Rupert Murdoch's wife, they still wanted one million pounds for her. The phone call suddenly made police spring into action, as it was now clear that Muriel had not simply ran out on her husband. She had obviously been taken against her will. Chief Superintendent Bill Smith said in an interview at the time that they were now treating it as an abduction, and that there were many things that were strange about the scene including that Muriel had left her shoes that she would normally go out in and that the car was still in the garage and clearly she had not used it to drive off in herself. Officers once again returned to the Mackay's home in Wimbledon to search it for any other clues, taking police sniffer dogs in to try and pick up Muriel's scent. They were not exactly sure where they should begin looking in the investigation and it was later reported that the FBI were consulted by the police to gain their expertise about what they should do next. It wasn't long before another call from the supposed kidnappers was made to the Mackay home. This phone call asked if they had received a letter yet from Mrs Mackay, and in the next breath, they asked if they had managed to get the money together for the ransom. Some reports also state that the kidnappers allowed Muriel to go on the phone for a short while. The day after the phone call, a letter did arrive in the post. It was established that the letter had indeed been written by Muriel. However, the way that it was written immediately stood out to everyone. The words were all over the page in different and incorrect positions. The police quickly speculated that this may have been due to being blindfolded when she was writing it. In the letter, Muriel pleaded to her husband, Please do something to get me home. I think of you constantly. What have I done to deserve this treatment? The letter was a heartbreaking one to receive for Alec and his family, and their determination to try and get her found increased. The police were anxious to try and keep the contents of the letter secret possibly to keep details back that anyone connected to the case may know, or to avoid media speculation. However, this proved extremely difficult, as the day after the letter arrived, the newspapers were already running the story about it, and details that were contained in it. Due to Alec's connection with the media, it proved tricky for police to keep any details out of the public eye, and for the nation this was such a shocking and difficult crime to comprehend. While the police continued their investigation, Alec and Muriel's daughter made an appeal to the kidnappers. She made a heartfelt appeal and explained that her mother was someone who would never hurt anyone and that she hoped she could be brought home. These appeals made the public even more aware of Muriel's disappearance and the crime was sending shockwaves throughout the country. Alec Mackay also made several TV appeals to anyone who might know something and stated that they could contact him directly. The contact between the family, police and the kidnappers had been very erratic and the kidnappers' phone calls and letters were not consistent. This frustrated police as they did not have clear instructions for how they could find Muriel or how the kidnappers would want the money delivered for ransom. Letters did continue to come in from both the kidnappers and Muriel, however the police were unsure if their contact was recent or had been written weeks before. The letters continued throughout January 1970, containing demands for cash and threats to harm Muriel. Another phone call was also made by the kidnappers, who were still insisting on the £1 million ransom and dismissed claims by the family that they simply did not have that kind of money. £1 million in 1969 would have been worth over £16 million today. While the Mackays were relatively wealthy people, they certainly did not have that kind of money to hand. 
the police were increasingly worried about the escalating situation and the police investigation continued to try and find any leads despite the lack of information or instructions from the kidnappers. Chief Superintendent Smith was frustrated as the investigation had not made a lot of progress. It had by this point become one of the largest investigations since the Great Train Robbery and there were large numbers of officers working from Wimbledon Police Station. It is reported that hundreds of statements were taken in relation to Muriel's disappearance. Despite this, police did not appear to be getting any closer to finding out who had Muriel. They received a number of false leads and hoax calls, and a lot of police time was taken up with deciding which leads were credible and which weren't. It is reported that due to the investigation faltering, the family decided to consult a psychic by the name of Gerard Quazé. Quazé was a Dutch psychic and parapsychologist who had a reputation for being able to find missing people. Quazé was most known for being invited out to Australia to give his opinion on what he believed happened to the three Beaumont children that went missing from Glenelg Beach in Adelaide three years earlier, in 1966. During his visit, Quazé stated that the children were buried in a warehouse near their home. The police searched the property extensively, however they did not find any evidence of the children. While in Australia, Quazé did not provide police with any tips that led them to find out where they were. In later years, Quazé's reputation would be damaged due to the number of cases he was not able to solve or provide any information about. However, in 1970, Quazé's reputation was still quite good and he was asked by the public and police forces to help in investigations. A friend of the Mackays travelled to Utrecht in the Netherlands to gain some insight from Quazé where Muriel might be. He was able to provide some information and stated that Muriel was in a white farmhouse north or northeast of London. The farm was close to another farm and an abandoned aerodrome. He also gave a warning that if she was not found within 14 days that she would be killed. A search of the area around the Mackay's house, including fields and other rural tracks and roads, had already been underway. However, some decided to take a look in the areas specified by Quazé and began to search for farmhouses north or northeast of London. They looked in both Essex and Hertfordshire and attempted to track down white farmhouses that might have fit that description. Unfortunately, despite searching these areas, no evidence that Muriel was there or had been in one of these farmhouses was found. The search was becoming desperate and the erratic nature of the contacts from the kidnappers was frustrating to everyone involved. Finally, after a number of calls that went nowhere, the kidnappers rang the family on the 1st of February and explained that they wanted the Mackay's son Ian to deliver half a million pounds to an area on the A10 road leading out of London. The police decided to get a policeman to play the role of the Mackay's son and they placed other covert police officers in the area. Ian was also asked to place some paper flowers in a phone box and wait for instruction. The detective posing as Ian did as asked. While in theory this was a good idea, the presence of police was deemed to have been too obvious as the kidnappers did not turn up for the money. This was another blow to the family who believed this could have been the chance to finally get Muriel back. It was now two months after she had been kidnapped and the family were desperate to know where she was. Alec continued to make appeals, and he stated in a TV appeal, Of course I'm terribly worried. I'm frantic that I couldn't get my wife back again. What can I do? The police were already forming a new plan, and a new day to hand over the money. They arranged another day with the kidnappers, and made a plan to hand over the money, this time on the 6th of February. The kidnappers wanted Alec and his daughter to hand over the money this time. Once again detectives played the role of the family members, with one detective placed in the boot of the car. 
They were initially told to travel by tube to drop the money at several different phone boxes, including one in Bethnal Green, before being told to travel to Epping. They were then given more instructions as to where to leave the money. The kidnappers told them to get a taxi to Bishop Startford. Bishop Startford is a town in Hertfordshire, around 24 minutes, in a car from Epping and around 17 miles. They were reportedly instructed to leave the money behind a mini that was parked by a forecourt of a garage. They were then told to go back to Epping. The detectives delivered the money in two beige suitcases and then returned as instructed to Epping. However, other officers took up positions close to the scene. They waited to see who would turn up, or if anyone would show any interest in the suitcases. While at the scene, officers observed a blue Volvo car drive slowly past. The Volvo stopped briefly close to the suitcases and a man looked out of the car and observed them on the side of the road. The car drove off and then around half an hour later returned to the scene, the man again looking closely at the suitcases. The car once again drove off, this time in the direction of Bishop Startford. Later on that evening, the same car returned to the area, this time with a passenger. This passenger was another male. Again, they observed the suitcases and drove off. The surveillance indicated that the passengers in the car must have had a significant interest in the suitcases and that they must have had something to do with Muriel's disappearance. Officers were so close to the scene that they were able to get a look at who was driving the car. The police were also able to note the registration number as XGO994G. While police were watching the scene, another car was noted to have driven up to the suitcases, and it was later discovered that this was a concerned couple who lived in the area and were worried about what the suitcases may contain. They later returned with the local police. The officers decided to call off the operation just before midnight on the 6th of February. They now had an extremely solid lead and were able to trace the registration of the blue Volvo. The police finally had the name of a suspect, Arthur Hossein. The officers traced where Hossein lived and discovered that he owned a farmhouse called Rook's Farm, close to Stocking Pelham in Hertfordshire, and he lived there with his brother Nizam Adeen. The brothers were originally from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean and had bought the farmhouse with a mortgage in 1967. The police were sure that the brothers must have had something to do with the crime due to their suspicious behaviour in the car the night before. They didn't waste any time and raided the farmhouse at 8am the next morning on the 7th of February. The officers were reportedly invited into the house by Arthur Hussein. An officer cautioned him while other officers searched the scene for any sign that Muriel was there or had been there. A search of the house and the surroundings were made at the time of this raid, however they were unable to locate Muriel. The officers reportedly found some notepaper in one of the bedrooms that was very similar to the paper that was used to write some of the letters sent from Muriel to her husband. The two brothers were brought in for questioning by police while further teams made several more searches of the farmhouse. Arthur and Nizamuddin Hussein were questioned extensively about their whereabouts at different points during the kidnapping investigation and their own knowledge of Muriel's disappearance. In an article in the Newcastle Journal on the 18th of September 1970, it was reported that Arthur Hussein stated that on the 29th of December 1969, the day that Muriel was kidnapped, he was at the farm all day with his brother. He said that he did go out in the evening but returned home at around 8.30pm. He was also asked if he had ever been to Wimbledon, to which he reportedly replied, Where in Wimbledon? He said that he had no occasion to go to Wimbledon and that he did not read newspapers or watch TV, so had not heard about the investigation. When Nizam Adeen, or Nizam as he was called, was interviewed, the Newcastle Journal reported that he appeared extremely nervous 
and stated that I want to die, I can't say anything, let me see Arthur. He did, however, answer that on the evening of the 29th of December, he was with his brother, matching what Arthur had said. Nizam would also not sign the statements that he had made to police. Arthur reportedly said that he wanted to help the investigation, but that he did not know where Muriel was. The police looked into the brother's history at Rook's farm, and discovered that Arthur had been working as a tailor's cutter in Hackney, before settling down with a wife in Essex. He reportedly had aspirations of being a landowner, and had borrowed a lot of money to buy the farm in 1967. He had big ambitions of being a millionaire, and reportedly told neighbours about these dreams. However, due to the amount of money that he'd needed to borrow, it was discovered that he was suffering financially. The police began working on the theory that this was why the brothers had needed the ransom money, and this had been a large driving force for why they wanted to kidnap Anna Murdoch. The theory was that this had not gone to plan, and the brothers had quickly realised that they had kidnapped the wrong woman. They, however, decided to continue on with their plan. The meticulous search of the area around Rook's farm continued with a huge team of officers searching the grounds and the house by hand. Muriel was nowhere to be found. The police were able to recover a billhook tool used to cut meat, which was the same as a tool left at the Mackay's home, and some paper flowers which were very similar to ones left in the area of the ransom money drop-off. However, attempts to directly link them to the Mackay's house and the scene was very difficult to prove. However, it is reported that a palm print on one of the letters sent to the Mackay's was analysed and matched Arthur Hussain's. Despite not having Muriel's body or any direct evidence, the police decided to charge the brothers on seven counts. The main charge was that they murdered Muriel Mackay. The other charges included unlawfully carrying away Muriel, assaulting and imprisoning her, and sending a number of letters demanding money unlawfully and threatening to kill. The trial of Arthur and Nizamuddin Hussain began on the 14th of September 1970 at the Old Bailey and was presided over by Mr Justice Shaw and the prosecution was led by the Attorney General, Sir Peter Rawlinson. The trial was national news and the public were interested in what the result would be. It was quite a historic trial as it would be one of the first murder trials to go ahead without finding the victim's body. The prosecution discussed the scene and what was found there. They also explained how the investigation came to lie at the Hussain's door, particularly the link to the blue Volvo that was found at Rook's farm. They also brought a forensic scientist in to the stand to state that palm and fingerprints found on a magazine at the farmhouse, letters sent to the Mackays and a cigarette packet found in one of the telephone boxes stated in the phone calls for the ransom money all matched Arthur Hussain. Under cross-examination, the brothers passed blame between the two of them, Nizam in particular admitting that they had driven to the drop-off locations and that Arthur had put him up to it, and he knew that it was wrong. Arthur stated his innocence and that he had nothing to do with Muriel's disappearance. He also accused the police of mentally and physically abusing him. In an article in the Coventry Evening Telegraph on the 22nd of September 1970, Arthur Hussain stated, referring to Detective Superintendent Smith, Smith beat the hell out of me while under the influence of drink. He also claimed that he had not eaten or slept properly for two days. The officers involved in the investigation denied these claims. In the summing up at the trial, the prosecution set out their theory of what happened. They set out that the brothers were facing financial hardship due to the purchase of Rook's farm. After seeing an interview with Rupert Murdoch on TV, they decided to kidnap his wife Anna. After following Murdoch's Rolls Royce, the brothers believed that this was his home and set about making a plan to gain access to the home. The brothers were not aware, however, that Alec Mackay had been borrowing Rupert Murdoch's Rolls-Royce while he was on holiday with his wife back in Australia. 
The brothers managed to gain access to the house while Muriel was home alone. They kidnapped her and held her hostage, making her send letters to her husband. The prosecution also speculated that at some point the brothers decided to kill Muriel and dispose of her body. It was not known how this was done, however, and of course the prosecution had to concede that they had not found her body. The trial lasted nearly a month, and on the 6th of October, the jury of nine men and three women retired to consider the verdict. The jury took four hours and six minutes to come to a decision. They returned to the courtroom and the foreman delivered the verdict. The jury had found the two brothers guilty of all the charges. Arthur Hussain reacted violently to the verdict, shouting abuse at Mr Justice Shaw, declaring that he wasn't impartial at the trial. The judge sentenced Arthur Hussain to life imprisonment for murder plus 25 years to run concurrently for all the other charges. He charged Nizamuddin Hussain to life imprisonment plus 15 years to run concurrently. Mr Justice Shaw said the kidnapping of Mrs Mackay was cold-blooded and was abominable. She was snatched from the security and comfort of her home, and so long as she remained alive, she was reduced to terror and despair. Their conduct has shocked every right-minded citizen, and the punishment has to be salutary, otherwise law-abiding citizens will not be safe in their own homes. Muriel's family were shocked and upset by the end of the trial and it is reported that Alec Mackay said, Oh God, I wish I knew what happened to my wife. This statement was echoed by many hearing about the outcome of the case. Despite the fact that the police had been successful in getting a conviction, the tragic part was that Muriel had not been found. The investigation had lasted months and meant a number of covert operations. The Aberdeen Press and Journal on the 7th of October 1970 declared that the investigation had cost £100,000 and had utilised hundreds of officers, but unfortunately this had not led to Muriel's discovery. The Mackay family, although relieved that the trial was over and that the perpetrators had been found, were not comforted that it was still not clear what had happened to Muriel. This trial was also a historic one, as it was one of the first trials in which a conviction was obtained through purely circumstantial evidence with no body being found. The police were extremely pleased with the conviction, as they believed through investigation that they had found the right people that had committed the crime. The fact that no body was recovered, however, has meant that some people are unsure of the stability of the conviction, and some maintain that it may not have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The Hossein brothers never disclosed where Muriel's body was. They both served 20 years in prison for the murder, and while Nizamuddin Hussain was deported back to Trinidad after his release, Arthur Hussain was a British subject and remained in the UK. The case has been remembered due to the tragic and brutal way in which it was carried out, and the national outrage that the kidnapping caused. The fact that Muriel was never recovered has remained one of the most awful parts of this case, and her story should not be forgotten. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I want to thank our newest patrons, Edward Cox and Philip Ross, for supporting the show on Patreon. Your support is appreciated immensely and it helps the show to get better and better, so thank you. I would also like to thank everyone that has left us a five-star review recently. Bruce Fluffy Toes, Spurs Hater and Alex Grapethin. If you want to support the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Or if you want to support us on Patreon, you can find us at www.patreon.com slash theunseenpod. You can get shout-outs, personal goodies, and we'll soon be getting additional bonus content. I've been getting so many amazing suggestions for cases recently, so if you want to email us a suggestion, send it to theunseenpod at gmail.com. I always appreciate any cases you think would be perfect for the podcast. You can also connect with us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Unseen Podcast. We also have a Facebook discussion group that you can join to talk about episodes and everything true crime. 
Thank you also to everyone who has been sending me messages of support recently. They really make my day. Stay tuned today for a promo from Melissa at the Haunted Ride podcast. Once again, thanks for listening, and until next time, I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen. Hi, I'm Melissa Cummins from The Haunted Ride, a paranormal podcast dedicated to you and your experiences. I know what it's like to have something happen to you that's unexplainable, and how it feels to want to tell someone but you're concerned they may think you're crazy. Whether it's a disembodied voice, an apparition, or something you just can't explain, this is your place to share it. So come tune in with me every week while we discuss anything and everything that falls into our paranormal and supernatural world. Because ghosts are out there, and if you're not careful, they will get you.